I appreciate that he didn't try to say my last name. My last name is Funches, and uh, I knew that he was kind of bailing on that one, not trying to pronounce that one. Last name Funches, which is ironic. Um, it's spelled fun and chess, the game chess. Uh, I don't play chess, uh, and I'm not very much fun, honestly. Um, ben, if, if you were here yesterday, you heard Ben speak. Um, ben, ben and I are about as complete opposites as you could possibly get. He's fun, and I'm not. Uh, he likes to listen to screamo music, and uh, and I like Rachmaninoff and WC, and you know, yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> well, one, somebody's one person's going to listen to me today. That's good. Um, <clears throat> So he and I are about as exact opposite as you could possibly get, um, but I love Ben, and he's one of my best friends. Uh, it's, it's interesting, before we ever made this trip, we, we are not representatives for the seminary as much as we're pastors at Colonial Baptist Church in Cary, North Carolina. And uh, before we made this trip, uh, we didn't know what we were going to speak on. I didn't know what he was going to speak on, really. And both of us had messages laid on our hearts that were just like perfect for each other. Um, messages about unity. And Ben and I really, we were talking about this last night, we are kind of a living example of that, right? Um, unity is not about what we have in common with each other as far as our social status, um, our geographical location, um, how much you know, money we have or what sport we play. The, the world likes to build community or unity around things that they share in common, uh, like those geographical locations, um, social status, and other things like that. But, but our unity, our community, as brothers and sisters in Christ, is not based on the fact that we have anything in common. The fact of the matter is, and I'm looking at you, I'm 34 years old, I'm in my mid-30s. Um, I, I, I can't relate probably to a lot of you in your life right now, going through college. I'm married, and I just found out we're going to have our sixth child. <laughs> I'm guessing you're probably not there in your life right now. <laughs> I'm guessing. My concerns, the things I think are fun, the things I think are interesting, my life really has nothing in common with yours. But see, in Christ, we don't, we don't have a bond, we don't have unity over those things we have in common. We, we could have nothing in common, and yet we have everything that's actually important in common. We have something eternal in common. And that is the basis for our unity. That is the basis for our community. Not even the fact that we like each other that much. I think a lot of times people try to build or encourage or, or manufacture community. You don't manufacture community. The world manufactures community. We don't manufacture community. We are a community. And very important to that community is the fact that we live in unity. If we don't live unified, that community is made useless in the world's eyes. Ben hit on a lot of very important points yesterday in his message. And many of those same things are going to come up in this message this morning. But I, I would like to give you a visual of unity. A visual picture from Scripture of the unity that we're talking about. If you will, go to the book of Acts, chapter number 4. Now, 
<laughs> I came across this passage. I've read it, I don't know how many times, probably in my life, but I came across this uh, passage a couple of months ago. I was going through the book of Acts with middle schoolers and um, saw this passage. It's, it's almost like for the first time, really understood what it was saying. And uh, what a great passage. Chapter 4 of Acts, starting in verse 32. Like many of you, I, I, I heard, I've heard a lot of bad preaching in my life. Uh, a lot of preaching that uh, doesn't really honor the text. And this passage is one of those passages that I've heard mispreached so many times. Uh, and, and was such a such a conviction to me when I actually saw it and, and realized what it meant, what it was saying. Start in verse 32 of chapter 4, if you will. The Bible says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Stop right there for a second. Think about what you just read. Now the full number, everyone who believed, the full number of those who believed, by this time it's in the thousands, right? Thousands and thousands of people. The full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Wow, I haven't marked my Bible just the word wow. The full number of those that had believed to this point were of one heart and one soul. They were unified. And no one said, continuing on, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Now that, that verse is not telling us what we have to do today in our church. We don't have to practice this to be unified. It's just showing us how unified they were. They were so unified that they did not count their personal possessions as their own. Now, I would agree to this, by the way, if you wanted to agree to this. I would drive your car if you wanted to drive my car. That would be fine with me. I would live in your house if you... No, I wouldn't. You live in a dorm room. What am I saying? I don't know what I'm saying. <clears throat> but they were so unified that they didn't even count their own personal property as their own. But they shared everything in common. And with, verse 33, don't miss this, and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. I want to be a part of a church like that. Where the resurrection is preached with great power. And great grace is upon all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. The Israelites, under the law, were commanded to look out for those who were poor and needy, the widows, fatherless. They were commanded to make provision for them. The nations that surrounded Israel would not make provision for these outcasts. But life in Israel was to be different. Life under the living God was supposed to be different. And so in the law was built these provisions to make, make uh, provision for the widows and the, the needy. I, I want to make a distinction between the law, life under the law, 
and what's happening here in this church. They are not commanded to do this at this point. They don't have to do this. There's not a mandate that says they have to share all their stuff. There's not a command that says they have to take care of those that are needy. The fact that they took care of the needy was a direct result of their unity. They cared about everyone else before themselves. And they looked around and they saw some people that had need and they said, how can I help these people that are, are of one heart and one soul with me? And they sold what they had and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet and the apostles took the money and distributed it to everyone who had need. But they weren't commanded to do this. I think that's an important point. They weren't commanded to do this. No one was making them do this. This was the result of unity. You know, we, we make a lot of commands in churches today, and we try to manufacture, again, things like this, we try to manufacture this care for the needy and the care for, for those around us who are hurting. And it seems like we, we're dragging people to do this. Doing everything we can to convince them or to, to guilt them into taking care of those around them that need taken care of. But I'm telling you that, that if we were unified, that would be the natural result of our unity. Let me talk about evangelism for a second. We have to convince people or drag people or trick people or guilt people into evangelizing most, most of the time. We have to make evangelism programs that kind of teach people how to, how to tell people about Jesus. I believe with all my heart if we were unified, that would not have to happen. We would be testifying of the resurrection of Jesus naturally. This would be what we did. But instead, we are a church full of individuals that have their individual lives at their heart. Not the community. Not the body. Not Christ. Verse 36 and 37 gives you an example, a living example of this unity in the person of Barnabas. Just read this with me quickly. Thus, in this way, or, or it's actually a conjunction there, Joseph, who is also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold of field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas then, I, I think Luke is introducing the character here into this narrative, but, but Barnabas serves here as an example of unity. Barnabas has a piece of property, he sells it, he brings the money to the apostles' feet and says, use it wherever you need to use it. And then chapter 5. I hate that there's a number there that separates this story in our minds. The beginning of chapter 5 is a continuation of the story. We just had a positive example of this unity. Now we're going to have a negative example. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property just like everyone else did. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? After it was sold, was it not at your disposal? He, Peter's pointing out that this was not a commandment. He wasn't, they weren't making people sell their land and give their money. He goes on and says, Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God.
When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the, the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon all, or upon the whole church, and upon all who heard of these things. So we have a positive example in Barnabas of what that unity looks like. And then this story of Ananias and Sapphira. Now, when I was growing up, I heard this message preached and I was terrified to death that I would die if I lied. And then I lied a few times and I didn't die. And so I didn't understand what was going on, right? Well, this passage doesn't tell us that if we lie, we're going to be killed on the spot. The passage needs to be read in its context. Understand what's happening. The church is unified. They're one heart, one soul. So much to the point that they, they are not even acknowledging personal property. They are selling what they have, bringing the money, giving to all those, those that have need. There's great power in the church. The Holy Spirit is, a, is effective in this church. And then there's opposition. This is unity opposed. Ananias and Sapphira see what everyone else is doing. To be quite honest, they make this plan so that they can seem like they are part of the group. They don't want to be pointed out as not being, you know, part of the group. They don't want to be exposed for who they really are. It says, Peter says that Satan fills their heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Peter goes on and tells them that they do not lie to men but to God. This is seen as a direct attack upon God and His Spirit. And here's what they do. This is it. Ananias and Sapphira elevate themselves over the rest of the group. They seek to achieve, they're motivated by a personal agenda, a selfishness, a self-centeredness, and it is the work of Satan in an attack upon the work of God. They oppose unity. I've got just a couple of points to make and then we'll be done, okay? Point number one. The exaltation of self opposes unity. The exaltation of self opposes unity. You could say it this way. Our sin, our sin 
is the opposition to unity. Why are we not unified? I mean, all of our hearts, as we were reading that first part of, of, of this passage, chapter 4, verse 32, as we were reading that, our hearts are like, wow, that would be something if we could have that. Why don't we have that? Because we are self-exalting individuals by nature. It is our sinful nature. Sin at its essence is this exalting of self to the place that only God deserves to be. In sin, we take God out of His rightful place. We take God from where He should be and we put ourselves there. God who is the creator, the sustainer, the sovereign, the controller, the God who gives purpose and meaning, we put Him off to the side. We, we dethrone Him and we exalt ourselves to that place. And so all of our love and all of our devotion and all of our loyalty belongs to ourselves instead of God. I mean, why do we have to command people to love God? Have you ever thought about that? Why do we have to command people? Why, why are we commanded? Why does the Bible have to command people to love God? Shouldn't that be natural? God who created all things and sustains all things. God who gives you the very breath that you're breathing right now. Wouldn't it be just natural to love Him and to be devoted to Him and be loyal to Him above all things? But we're not. Because we've, we've removed Him from His rightful place and we put ourselves in that place. And now, don't miss this, now we are devoted to ourselves, our dreams, our ambitions, uh, what we want to do with our lives, our plans. And then we wonder why we don't have meaning. We wonder why we don't have purpose. We wonder why we're depressed. Because we sit in the place that only God deserves to sit. Our devotion belongs to self. And then, catch this, all the people around us serve to worship us. We use everyone around us to glorify ourselves. Every relationship. Every person that we come in contact with. We use them for ourselves. How, do you see how opposite that is? Of what's pictured here in Acts 4. In true unity. Why can't we see unity in the church? Because we're all a bunch of individuals who are here for us. And we can't get past that. Ben hit on so many things yesterday. Stole my thunder a little bit, actually, as he was talking about music and all of that. But isn't it true? Isn't it true that when we go to church, we are more concerned about our personal preferences I mean, the old generation, listen, the old generation, the generation that spit me out, all right, I'm a recovering fundamentalist, like some of you. The generation that spit me out, they were concerned about their personal preferences, and we in this younger generation are no better than they are with our personal preferences. I mean, I don't understand Ben. I hate his music. I can't understand what it's saying. But when I exalt my personal preferences, when I exalt myself, when I think that what I want and what I think in my opinions matter more than everybody else's, I can't have unity. Sin or the elevation, exaltation of self is what opposes unity. Point two, unity, unity is the way we image God.
Imaging God is inextricably linked. It, it cannot be torn away from. Imaging God is linked to relationship. You cannot, you are made in the image of God, but you cannot image God on an island by yourself. Who would you image God to? Imaging God and relationship go hand in hand. The way we image God is by being the community, by being unified in the community. That's how we image God. And when that is destroyed, we fail to image God. That's why Israel failed. And that's why we fail. Unity is the way we image God in relationship. So point three, and I've said this, but let me say it again. Our self-exaltation, then, is a direct attack on God's purpose of imaging Himself in His creation. When you sin, when you exalt yourself and love yourself, and devote yourself to yourself above everyone else. You are opposing God and His purposes. <clears throat> Sin is a direct attack on God's purpose of imaging Himself. Do you know, you want to know why God took the life of Ananias and Sapphira? Because God was sending a message to His church in its infancy as it was beginning. He was sending a message, much like He did to, with Achan. Remember in the story how Achan stole the stuff from Jericho and hid it? Achan was elevating himself. He, he decided that he didn't have to obey. Although God had told all of the Israelites to obey, Achan didn't obey. And Achan hid the stuff under his tent. He was pointed out and his whole family and all of his possessions were destroyed. You say, wow, that's not fair. No, God is sending a point. Unity must be preserved. This is serious. The result was that great fear came upon the whole church. They, they understood the point. They understood the illustration. I'll be done. My wife and I, we, uh, there's a lot more I wanted to say or could say or whatever, but my wife and I, um, <clears throat> like I said, we, we have five children and one on the way, and um, we enjoy hanging out together a lot, you know, uh, when we can get a chance, because with five kids, there's not a whole lot of chance to just hang out, you know. And when, we, when we're spending time together, we like to listen to classical music or read novels together um, and a few weeks ago we were listening to a piece by Rachmaninoff and um, my wife is a classical pianist I don't understand much about classical music I love it but I don't know much about it like I don't have any musical ability and I was listening to this piece we were actually watching it on YouTube and I'm telling you what, every, my wife used to tell me about this kind of stuff, but I, I never experienced it. I, I, I was brought to tears by listening to this piece of music. Every instrument, 
every individual artist was in perfect sync. Perfect harmony. Even their bows and everything moved together. They, they were one. As I watched the conductor, the conductor moved every piece and, and, and every, every section with great skill. And it was, it was amazing. I don't know that I had ever watched it that closely. But here's the deal. All of them, this occurred to me as I watched, all of them were working and were playing for something they believed to be greater than themselves or their own talent or their own ability or their own agenda. They played for something they believed to be bigger and more important than themselves. As the conductor conducted, he wasn't even conducting his own music. He was conducting some other composer's music. But he did it with such care. He did it with, with such passion. It wasn't even his music. All of them working to exalt, honestly, to exalt this composer. And the way this composer had written this music. And it was beautiful. And I thought as I watched, I thought, what if what if just one, what if just one artist, what if just one cellist or, or violinist or what if just one instrument? decided to play for themselves or to play their own piece of music or to do their own thing in the midst of that. It would destroy all of it. It would destroy everything. Does that make sense? When you exalt yourself over others. And I, I wanted so bad to read several passages, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all of them speak to, to preferring others. What does Philippians say? Look at others more significant than yourselves. When we sin, when we exalt ourselves over others, over the group, we destroy the picture. We destroy the unity. We must live our lives for something bigger than ourselves. The individual should not be exalted over the community. Christ died for the church, not just a bunch of individuals. We must live in unity by humbling ourselves, preferring one another before ourselves. Unity must be our pursuit. And it starts here on campus, I would think. It starts in your relationships, immediate relationships. And it goes to your church relationships as well. Obviously the church I don't know where you go to church. I don't know how you're involved in church. But seek unity there at all costs. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for your word. I pray that you would use it in our lives and that you would get the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen.